Hey, a bunch of lebs beat some guy up. Why'd they do that? Because what happened yesterday? Oh, the festival. It wasn't a festival, it was a riot. <laughs> now, you be a good girl for mummy, all right? Where are you going? Daddy's got to go beat up some wogs. It's the day after the riots and Sydney is a city on edge. When in with us. Hello and welcome back to our listeners. Glad to be joining you again for another week of the Memory and History podcast. What I just played for you there is part of a trailer from the 2016 film titled Down Under, led by the Australian director Abraham Forsyth. It's this really terrific black comedy which follows two groups of young men as they live in the wake of the Cronulla riots. If you weren't able to catch it during its initial release, fear not, it's available now to stream on Netflix and I highly recommend that you check it out. The reason why I say that is not just because it's a great piece of Australian film, but because it explores some very interesting themes and ideas about the Cronulla riots. In my opinion, it presents a poignant example of some of the types of narratives which have collected around the riots, and we'll get into that a little later. It's fair to say, however, that whenever the topic is mentioned, very distinctive images and words will immediately come to one's mind. I assume that for many of the local audiences listening in, you would have heard of the events which occurred across the 11th and 12th of December in 2005. Maybe you can even remember what you were up to when news of the riots was first broadcast across Australia, and images of both the ugliness of violence and the ugliness of racism spread and re-entered the public consciousness of Australia. For me though, I was just five years old when the riots played out in Sydney too young really to hold any solid memories of the event, but old enough to remember dinner time conversations and media reflections as the years rolled on during the various anniversaries and scandals which threw the riots back into the public spotlight. And so, I find myself sharing perhaps as many young people of a similar age do, a somewhat second-hand or rather third-hand recollection of the day. For this reason, the rights present an interesting challenge to historians, attempting to make sense of a past which, in a different sense of the word, is still very much present in the conversations and concerns of our present day. And so I wonder, to what extent can we be guided by these assumptions stemming from our own personal recollection of the event? Where is the line between history and memory? I think, potentially, it's quite blurry. But this is exactly what I want to try and understand better in today's podcast, because I think it's important to decipher and deconstruct the various narratives which have persisted and formed in the wake of the Cronulla riots. I want to take a historical approach to understand exactly how the riots are remembered and what this tells us about our self-conceptions as Australians. To do so, it might be useful to start with a timeline of the events which occurred across the 11th and 12th of December, as it's from this foundation where we can begin to dissect and challenge popular memory of the riots. It's the 4th of December in the year 2005 at the height of the Australian summer. Two surf lifesavers, both off duty, have just been assaulted at North Cronulla Beach. What occurs in the days following is something akin to a media frenzy. In the New Sydney Morning Herald, police cuts are blamed for a beach gang attack. Whilst the tabloid newspaper The Daily Telegraph prints the headline, Fight for Cronulla, We Want Our Beach Back. Certainly, such views are not relegated to the news media sphere. Here is an excerpt from the popular 2GB radio show hosted by Alan Jones, in which a caller named John vents his views live on air. If the police can't do the job, the next tier is us. Yeah, good on you, John. Now, uh, you know, my grandfather was an old digger and he used to say to me when we were growing up, listen, shoot one, the rest will run. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Posters and text chains circulate the public with talks of a gathering at North Cronulla Beach going down, planned for the 11th. These plans, indeed, come to fruition and at 8 o'clock on the 11th, crowds begin to gather. A later police investigation of the events estimates almost 5,000 people having gathered at North Cronulla Surf Life Saving Club. They spill out across to Dunningham Park and out into the streets. In photographs of the incident which emerge later, participants can be seen draped in iconography of the Australian state, with Southern Cross constellations painted on their shoulders. 
Some individuals can be seen with the statement, we grew here, you flew here, plastered across their backs. Alcohol is present and so is the media. Tensions grow and the crowd becomes louder, larger and more decentralised, spreading out into different areas of the suburb. It was billed as the day Cronulla residents would take back the beaches, but it soon turned into a riot. Dozens of police officers used batons and capsicum spray to control an angry mob that had gathered at Cronulla Railway Station. Hordes of angry youths had been tearing around Cronulla all day looking for a fight. By one o'clock, physical violence erupts, with a man being chased along Prince Street and needing to seek refuge in the North Cronulla Hotel with police protection. These sporadic, opportunistic and seemingly uncoordinated attacks continue throughout the rest of the day. They vary in scale and the degree of violence exerted by the assailants. A later report finds that most of those arrested are of white, quote, Caucasian appearance and the victims are of, quote, Middle Eastern appearance. Police reports of the incident show that by 5.20pm the same day, the, quote, reprisals start. This begins at St. George Hospital, with groups of, quote, Middle Eastern appearing males gathering at the hospital and throwing bottles. Public disorder continues throughout the night, with these groups 30 to 100 large, causing damage to property and assaulting random targets. Weapons are involved in some incidents. The following day, on the 12th, SMS messages circulate publicising and gathering at the Lakemba Mosque, and by 6pm, police estimate a crowd of 1,500 to 2,000 people having gathered outside the site. Throughout the night, groups of young men also carry out random attacks on individuals. They carry weapons like iron bars, baseball bats and firearms. With that laid down, let's now turn to how the riots are remembered. From an early stage, participants and supporters sought to moralise the rights by adopting a community values-based approach. In this version of events, the existing cultural norms and values of the community worked as moralising forces to mitigate and to justify not only the initial gatherings, but also the violence which ensued. Under this light, the riots became, in the eyes of some, not dishonourable acts of mob violence or even of racism, but rather, quote, a rally, a street march, call it what you will, a community show of force, as was put by Alan Jones in the lead up to the riots. Jones is framing this as a protest, as a exercise of democracy, which was, quote, not about keeping Australia white, but about keeping Australia right, having the right people, the right culture and the right feeling. Sentiments such as these were not uncommon, and they were used by supporters and participants alike to differentiate and by extension justify the violence committed on that day. Importantly, I think it is from here where we can identify the starting point of some of the narratives which have formed in the Australian imagination of Cronulla. The, what I like to call, it isn't about race, but recollection of events. The key to understanding how this memory persists lays in unpacking the ways in which tolerance operates within it. As Amanda Wise, Professor of Sociology at the University of Macquarie explains, this twisted language of tolerance is appropriated in quite problematic ways. The logic goes something like this. Because Muslims are intolerant, we cannot tolerate them. Tolerance itself becomes the delimiting boundary of national belonging. In this understanding, the Middle Eastern Muslims become the disruptive element in an otherwise harmonious multicultural community of the Shire. This idea is clearly evident in a poster which publicised the 11th of December as a bid to quote clean up Australia and the, in the lines of its preceding paragraphs reads as Perhaps they are not here to swim, but to enjoy the warmth of not only the beach, but of the people of Cronulla. 
However, because it is apparent that this is not the case, the filth that crawls off the trains and pollutes our beaches has decided to attack an Australian icon. Therefore, we can no longer tolerate this behaviour, and thus, all Australians should unite and strike down upon these invaders. I think this idea of tolerance in many ways, or rather, this idea of intolerance in many ways, is integral to understanding the narratives which have persisted in the wake of the riots. It did shock me in the park when um, them two boys got attacked, but on the TV it made out as if they were poor innocent little kids, like they were, but they were being smart asses and I know like like everyone was being like not racist but everyone was saying like Aussie 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 making them say it and then someone screamed out oh all you wogs go back to where you came from and then one of them turned around and said oh hey I'm wog but I'm down here supporting Australia. They, they, I mean they, they had shoes and socks on they didn't have a towel with them and they walked right through the middle of, an, of what was an angry um, mob of youth at that time but I thought it would probably get the reaction that they desired to get. Which was? To get the media on side and to turn it from something that was about the beach as a safe place into something that was a race issue, which I don't think it was at all. These two clips quite clearly demonstrate how the idea of intolerance exists and operates within this narrative of the Cronulla riots, which views race as almost an inexistent factor of causation. However, that doesn't mean that it can't be observed in other narratives. I think it most certainly can, albeit in a different way and towards a different group of people. Perhaps we should now turn to what we might think of as adjacent to this view of the riots, the recollection of the Cronulla riots as a product of a loud and vocal minority of rat bags. What happened on that day, I happened to be there, and that was a demonstration of frustration, not a racial riot. Now, if the New South Wales police of this state had been carrying, had been jumping onto these people and doing their duty, it would never ever happen. Admittedly, there were some rat bags there on that day, but what happened was the young blokes down there got fueled up on alcohol and testosterone. I, I really think that the, the jellyback senior police of this New South Wales police should be doing something about it because it's just got out of hand. There are two main elements to this version of events. First, there's an observable disavowing which occurs, in that the violence of the riots is reduced to uncondonable thuggish behaviour. And second, as a result of this, there's also a definitive scapegoating of sections of the Australian society. The so-called thugs, or rap bags, represented as orchestrating forces of the riots. It should not escape notice that it is this version of events which simultaneously alleviates the cognitive dissonance of the riots, which remain purported by some as, at least initially, peaceful protests, which only became violent and thus wrong when specific sets of individuals became out of control. It was nothing what the media made out. It was a good, not a good day, but... Most of the day, most of the people there were just there for a good time. Hang on, um, the media didn't beat that up. That happened. I know, I know, but that was only part of what was there. It's a pretty ugly part. Oh, of course it is. Of course it is. But it was a long time coming. But, but we... nothing would justify the violence on either day. The first day no. of young Australians beating up some boys because they were Muslim is no. unacceptable. And it goes on both parts. I don't condone any of it. I, I'm totally against all of it. But... I just want to know what else are we meant to do when this has been coming for years. Within this memory of the riot, there's almost always a reference to alcohol as a contributing factor. The logic goes that in an inebriated state, as explained by one of the audience members earlier, the violence occurred because young, quote, rat bags got fueled up on alcohol and testosterone. 